It feels like just yesterday we were gearing up to be excited for a Boston Celtics versus Denver Nuggets finals before the Boston Celtics would go down 3-0 to zero to the Miami Heat and what would be the third Eastern Conference Finals battle in four seasons between these two teams. However, the Celtics forced a Game 7 before dropping the ball, ultimately allowing the Miami Heat to make the NBA Finals. Fast forward to the start of this season, we see the Boston Celtics acquire Drew Holiday, Chris Topps Porzingis, move on from guys like Marcus Smart, and Malcolm Brogdon and many other people that the franchise loved. Then you fast forward a little bit further and the Boston Celtics sweep the Indiana Pacers as of last night in what some are dubbing to be the easiest finals run of all time. It's very funny to me how narratives switch up prior to the season starting. Once we saw the acquisitions of Drew and KP, most people kind of wrote the Celtics or penciled the Celtics in as the favorites of the Eastern Conference. So I just find it interesting that they may deal with some opponents that have injuries and now fans are saying it's a fraudulent run, even though, like I said, people believed the Celtics would beat anyone at full health and need I remind you, a 20-point-per-game score, almost a 10-rebound-per-game rim protector, Kristaps Porzingis has been very unhealthy a large majority of the NBA playoffs. He missed the entirety of the second round and the entirety of the Western Conference Finals, and we are not even sure if he's going to suit up for the NBA Finals. All of this being said, I have to say congratulations to the Boston Celtics. It takes a lot to bounce back from a devastating couple seasons. In 2023, you lose, like I said, at home Game 7 Eastern Conference Finals. 2022, you go into to the NBA Finals, you go up 2-1, to one, and then you lose to the Golden State Warriors. So we're talking three years where you've pretty much been at the cusp of being NBA champions, and you just aren't. This Boston team obviously screams difference from the past. I'm seeing a lot of people sort of dismiss what Jason Tatum is doing, kind of saying that they're empty stats, they're fake stats, or whatever. I think it's just very interesting, this narrative, because it seems when people start to excel at the highest level with or without big talent, there's no winning. Uh, we think back a couple years ago, the NBA media media dubbed Russell Westbrook averaging a triple-double as stat padding after he did it for three years in a row. Uh, he had virtually no help in those years, and people say, well, okay, he has no help. Uh, it's only him on the team. He, he had Paul George for a couple of those years, I understand. But people kind of brushed it off saying, look, if he's the only guy on the team that's an all-star, he should have those numbers. But then Jason Tatum averages 30 points, 10 rebounds, and 6 assists in the Eastern Conference Finals on a stacked roster, and people say, well, he's on a super team. He should average those numbers. So there's no way with the NBA media need I remind you guys. As no team in NBA history has come back from down 3-0, to I'm just going to talk a little bit about what I would think the Dallas Mavericks versus the Boston Celtics NBA Finals would look like. I think it'll be remarkably interesting to see who starts on Luka Doncic and who starts on Kyrie Irving on the defensive side of the ball. If we refer to the regular season matchups, we saw a lot of Derek White starting on Luka Doncic while Drew Holiday was on Kyrie Irving. This gives a ton of flexibility as JB and JT are both very great defenders as well. I'd love to see Jason Tatum get some some possessions where he is guarding Luca because from a size and length perspective, he matches up pretty decently with Luca. Obviously, Luca can back him down a little bit. And it's not because I don't think that Derek White is incapable of defending Luka Doncic. It's just that when you have such a prolific scorer uh, like Luka Doncic, if you give them a steady diet, they are going to, well, to put it simply, be able to find creases, mess ups, mistakes, whatever you want to call it, in your defensive scheme to score. If you keep giving them the same thing every single time, they're just going to pierce that coverage. I think especially with Kyrie Irving, you need to be constantly switching around what kind of possessions he's seeing. Maybe Jalen starts on him, then you have Derek White, then you have Drew Holiday, a couple possessions possessions with JT. Maybe if you're in your bench unit, you have Peyton Pritchard on him and you have other people in the drop to help and you kind of blitz him every time he gets the ball. With Kyrie and Luka, people are dubbing them to be the most talented backcourt of all time. Uh, you need to give them different, different coverages and it's amazing that the Celtics can flex their depth and give them four or five different guys who are all plus defenders. I think the X factor in this series though is going to be if Derek Lively or if Chris Topps Porzingis can come back and play if they're healthy. KP, Al Horford, Daniel Gafford, Derek Lively, all those guys are great, phenomenal rim protectors, but Al and KP can stretch the floor like no other. Both of these guys at some points of their career have been up to 40% three-point shooters. And need I remind you that Chris Topps and Al both recorded over 100 three-pointers made in the 2023 regular calendar season, um, which is remarkable for both of your bigs to be that versatile. The point of me bringing this up is that Derek and Gafford are amazing rim protectors, but if they can bring them out and, and stretch the floor like we saw in that matchup we saw in March, the Celtics, if they can hit their three, they'll start running Dallas off the floor pretty swiftly because they are so efficient.
if you bring Gafford and Lively out of the paint, it allows JB, JT, Derek Lively, Peyton Pritchard, Derek White. All these guys are getting better looks at the rim because they're big, they're big dogs, they're protectors, they're not there. And we know Kyrie and Luca, they give energy on defense, but they aren't known to be the best in the perimeter. And they're not any better down low where it hurts. The energy that Gaffer and Lively have supplied the Dallas Mavericks with in this series leading up to the NBA Finals has been seriously irreplaceable. I absolutely love Lively. He's a I almost had a word that would give me demonetized. He is a stud. I'm very interested to see how P.J. Washington, Dante Exum, if he gets minutes in this one. We saw some minutes from Hardy. Uh, a lot of div Jason Kidd is really flexing the depth that the Dallas Mavericks have. Another big name you got to give credit for is Derek Jones Jr. Um, he's just been absolutely remarkable. We kind of know him as this high-flying wing who can play some defense but can't really stretch the floor. He never had a 20-point per game, or he never had a 20-point playoff game going into this series. Uh, or going into this playoffs in general and he versus the Oklahoma City Thunder and he rattles off three 20 point games in a row and if you guys remember that game six he hit a nasty fadeaway jump shot at the shot clock's expiration that just really helped the Dallas Mavericks go ahead and put the Thunder away you never know what happens if that goes seven games uh, this is going to be interesting this this series the Dallas like like I said the Dallas Mavericks they have the ability to flex their depth a little bit more than the average fan may think ultimately I think the series cannot go go any amount of games that isn't six or seven. I don't think it's going to be a sweep. I don't think it's going to be a gentleman sweep. I think both of these coaches, they're very young. They're very talented. Jason Kidd has been impressing me a lot uh, going into this postseason. I didn't think he was the coach that he was. Uh, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how Boston reacts to being battle tested uh, as the Pacer series kind of indicated that they were somewhat ready for the moment. I think a lot of people will see that, hey, this was a sweep and they weren't playing a talented Pacers team and then Tyrese got hurt. It's supposed to be a free win. However, I think the series showed that who has been there and who has not. Like Boston has been on these deep playoff runs for a very long time. The Pacers have not. It's the first time making the Eastern Conference Finals since Paul George was a Pacer. It's over, over 10 years, guys. Um, I, I, there was a lot of times where the Pacers had a chance to win it in all four of those games when Boston was resilient. They remained calm. They won four in a row. That being said, I don't think Boston has played a team that is talented or as deep as Dallas. Uh, the, the Cavs, if they were fully healthy, are some, somewhat similar on paper, but not really because Luke and Kyrie are just really big game, game changers. My prediction would be Boston in six games if Kristaps Porzingis can return. And the NBA Finals are nine days away, so he does have a lot of time to heal up and get right. It's just going to be very interesting to see how Luka Doncic can perform in the series with his knee. Obviously, that's a big, big, big thing going forward. He, he's looked good in this, uh, you know, series against Minnesota, but we never really know. But what do you guys think? Who do you think is going to win the NBA Finals? Do you think the Wolves can come back, maybe? I don't know. Let me know in the comments below. If you made it this far, I appreciate your support as always. Hope you all have a great rest of your day. Stay happy, health, and blessed. Peace.